Now, scholars believe, strongly believe, that Isaiah was written by three people, so three Isaiahs. They say chapter 1, 1 to 39 was written by the original Isaiah, that is Isaiah of Jerusalem. 40 to 55 was written by a second Isaiah, whom they call Deutero Isaiah, because they said um, the original Isaiah could not have known about all those events. Those were events that happened in exile, in Babylon. And this is years after Isaiah. Now this final part, which is 56 to 66, they say was written by a third Isaiah, whom they call, they refer to as Trito Isaiah. Because this part was written after the exile, post-exilic, you know, after they left Babylon and went back to Jerusalem. So this Isaiah, Trito Isaiah, is now addressing the exiles back home. So the scholars are saying the original Isaiah could not have written about these later parts, but the first part is about events happening, you know, the warnings, the reprimands. So yeah, he wrote that one. So we're now looking at Trito Isaiah. So here, Isaiah offers hope to the people who have returned to Jerusalem. They are still, they are despondent, they are downcast, they, are, they, they think God is still um, cross with them. You know, they're still being punished for their sins because they've gone back to devastation, they've gone back to rack and ruin. And we'll also see this in the books of um, Haggai and Zechariah, which I have taught. Uh, um, incidentally, Haggai and Zechariah are contemporaries of Trito Isaiah. So if we go back a bit in um, the book of Haggai, uh, the people were saying that it's not yet time, it's not yet time to rebuild the temple. They got back, the whole place was in, the, in ruins. So they said before they rebuild the temple, the economy should be buoyant and things should, they should be harvest. They, they should start building their own houses first. They should have their businesses set up. Everything should be flourishing before they build the temple. So this was in the book of Haggai. So that's what the people were saying, it's not yet time, it's not yet time. So Prophet Hegel was telling the people that things are not working, you're not having harvest, you're, you're planting but you're harvesting a little, you're wearing clothes but you're still cold because there's holes in your, co in your clothes, there's holes in your pockets and your wallets, so you're not having enough money. You're saying that until things get better, until things get better, before you start building the temple, but things will not get better until you build the temple so you do have to do this first you know seek you first the kingdom of god and all all the things will be added on to you so you can't wait and say until things get better before we start building the temple he say no you're saying until things get better but you're building your paneled homes and you know, everything is uh, flourishing in your homes your businesses are booming but you're saying until things get better how much better do you want it to be things won't get better things will be getting worse until you build the temple so this was the message of Haggai to the exiles well returned back now to jerusalem and zechariah also was saying the same thing to the people that they cannot leave the temple unbuilt and be doing their own businesses and in the book of ezra which i've also taught we will see zechariah mustering up the people you know building up their courage and their morale and saying come on come on come on let's build the temple come on get up all of you and uh, the people got up as one they heard the word of the lord and they started rebuilding and under zerubbabel the governor that was how the build uh, the temple was rebuilt and finished and they had the temple back because they gone back to jerusalem but they had not recommenced the worship which they probably were not doing during their time of um, exile in Babylon. So they need to come back, not just uh, rebuild the social and e economic aspect of life, but also the worship, which would even be first. So in this part of Isaiah, try to Isaiah is also encouraging the people because they feel God is still upset with them because things are not happening as they thought, because all they thought was when they go back, Everything will just be back to normal. The prophets have said 
when they come back, you know, uh, nations will look towards them and there will be harvest and, and it didn't seem to be happening. So try to Isaiah saying that, no, God is no longer cross with you. He has forgiven you. He has removed his wrath as he promised. You know, they should be patient and they should just uh, keep on rebuilding the temple. Just do what they're supposed to do. So he reassured the exiles that God's punishment had ended. And if they remain faithful, God will reward them. They will become like a light to other nations, which will draw other people onto them, so much so that they will have a relationship with the God of Israel. Because they will see that things are working, things are prospering for the Israelites. They also want to have a part. You know how people are. Once they, there's the gold rush, gold, yeah, gold rush, all people rushed there to go and get gold. When they were digging up mines and they were finding gold, people all rushed there. Some people killed themselves. Some people died in this rush. Wherever there is this thing, uh, some years ago, um, a, a bank I was banking with was giving bonuses. So many people opened accounts because they wanted the share of these bonuses. It got so much that the bank had to say, okay, that's it. No more new accounts until all this is finished. So that people will see how God has blessed them. And they will also want to come and know their God and hold on to them and say, we want to serve this God that you are serving. This is how a Christian's life should be anyway. People should look at us and say, we want to know the God you are serving. You know, introduce me to this God of yours because things just seem to be working for you. So a Christian's life should advertise the glory of God. We should not be out there looking haggard. And some Christians don't smile. They're just too holy, too righteous. They don't smile. They don't greet you. They, they just feel like everyone is as sinners. You know, they're the only righteous people. It should not be like that. It shouldn't be like that. So, so um, their sorrow was expressed over the, the sins that they did. You know, they were still sorry about it. Because if they hadn't done all that, they wouldn't have been carted off in the first place. So, and then in this part of Isaiah, we can also see that God is all-inclusive. So he was talking about the foreigners and the eunuchs that had been ex ex exempted in, in Deuteronomy. That if they observe all his covenants, if they obey the Sabbath, observe the Sabbath and uh, the, the festivals, the sacrifices he will accept he will accept it from them so it became open now to the gentiles so it's not just the the jews it's not all inclusive and that's how our god is um, i heard a, a story of a, a prostitute who was uh, returning back from one of her clients it was a sunday morning she'd been out all night uh, you know plying her trade and on the way going home sunday morning she just felt led to go into a church and pray uh, but when she got to the door the ushers would not let her in that sorry we don't want your sort in here so she she walked away so i doubt like that woman would ever go into a church again but she's the sort that jesus came for you know she's the sort that should have been allowed into the church to meet with the lord you know but churches nowadays you have to be good to to be there you have to be obedient it's always yes sir, yes pastor yes pastor don't don't you dare oppose your pastor if not you'll be out that door no, don't you dare have an opinion of your own they'll be like no she's rebellious you'll be out that door you know but that's uh, churches shouldn't be meant for righteous people who told the lie you know it's meant for me people like me you know god will meet me there change me from the inside out so, and then uh, this try to Isaiah is also talking about the watchmen, that they are blind, they are failing to lead the people to, uh, to follow God. They are failing to warn them against idolatry and stuff like that. He said he calls them blind and dumb shepherds. So um, watchmen they have that task, that huge responsibility that God has given them to warn the people. Once they warn the people and the people don't turn against a way, then they are free, but if they don't warn and they keep quiet, the blood will be required out of the hand of that watchman. And that's all Christians, not just pastors, that's all Christians. And uh, he talked about the true fasting, that true fasting should be with true, uh, it should be accompanied by genuine repentance and express uh, concern for the poor. Uh, but the fasting that the people were doing 
which Zechariah also talked about, ends in quarreling and strife. Um, the food, instead of that food that they miss, when you miss a food, because you are fasting, maybe you miss your breakfast, that food should be given to the poor. If it's your lunch you miss, it should be given to the poor. But what people normally do is they will pack that breakfast, they will pack the lunch, they will pack the dinner, leave everything on the table. Then when they break the fast, they will not eat everything. That is not a fast. That's not the fast that God is talking about. He's saying your fast, you know, you need to look after the poor, look after the widow, look after those who are needy. That's the fast he's calling. But people, when they are doing, doing that fast, they're all pious and everything they, because they're hungry. You know, they're hungry. But immediately they break the fast. They try to, Isaiah was saying that, then they go and fight with people. It's like you now go up to the person and say, yes, now I have my energy back. What was it? What was it you were saying earlier? Repeat it now to my face if you dare. You know, and then they start fighting and quarreling after the fast. He said that is not the fast that God is talking about. And this is the what Zechariah also was talking about. When they asked that, should we still be fasting? Because we are not back home. We were fasting then because we were in exile. But we are not back home. And he said, even that fast, who was it for? It was for yourselves. You were not fasting for the Lord. I know a pastor. He can fast for 30 days nonstop. 30 days. He is really good. But if you offend him, you are finished. He does not forgive. And yet he can fast. 30 days he is fasting. This is what the Bible is saying about all those fasting, who is it for? Because it's definitely not for God. You know, if uh, you are doing all these uh, outward works of, you know, so people can see or what is it for? I mean, I can understand if you are fasting so that you can lose weight. But if you are doing it from a spiritual point of view and you don't forgive people, you oppress the poor, then it's pointless. It's just a waste of time. So he talks here about the fasting and the piety of the people. That they should do it with a right heart, a right motive, and not just because they're observing a spiritual exercise, you know, because a fast was called, so let's just fast. But your heart's not in it. You don't repent, you know, you don't change. All we can see is that you've lost a pound or two in weight, and that's it. That's not a fast. And then there was the communal sin and the communal lament over their sin, you know, over what they did. But uh, God is not saying that they should arise and shine, for their light has come. So Jerusalem's days of darkness will now be over. God is about to bring a new dawn, you know, to them, to Israel. Pagan nations will be drawn to, to the city, bearing all kinds of gifts. And, and we also saw this in the other parts of um, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. They all talked about how after the exile. Uh, people will come bearing gifts and you know everything every, people will be drawn to them then they will know that God is the living God that he's not an idol and he's the only God so we can see this uh, monotheism in in the book of Isaiah that God of Israel he alone is God all the other gods are idols they are made by human hand they're just made by people they're not real so he talks about that and then there's the the year of the lost fever Jesus read this part in Luke 4, 16 to 22, when he was in the temple. So he read this. The, what he read was is from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 61. I will read it. It's in, I'm reading from the NIV Bible, Quest Study Bible. The, year, uh, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So Jesus read not all of that, but that's what he was reading in the temple, Isaiah 61. And then when, after Jesus read it, he said, today you will see this fulfilled. So this was Jesus' mission as the servant Messiah. You know, so um, that was what he came to do, to set uh, people free from their bondage, to heal the sick, 
to open the eyes of the blind, you know, to draw us close to the Father. This is what Jesus came to do. So that's what was written there. And then in chapter 62, the exiles were wondering if God has abandoned them. And the God reassured them that they will no longer be called desolate or forsaken. He has given them a new name, which is Hepsiba, Hep, which means my delight. So they will no longer be called uh, forsaken because uh, nations were still thinking that they've been forsaken by God. And even the people themselves thought they'd been abandoned by God. But he says, no, your name has been changed. You are now called my delight, you know, my joy. You know, that's what you are like. Some parents have a favorite kid. Even if that, that parent is, is, is very uh, furious, you know, raging with madness, and that child comes and says, Mommy or Daddy, you know, stop. They, they just stop. And they tell the other party, you are lucky. My child, is, you are lucky. You know, so God is saying that, no, now you be called my delight. My joy, I have changed your name. No longer will you be called uh, forsaken. And then he... Um, he said that the watchmen at the gates should remind God daily. I give no rest to God until he reestablishes Jerusalem. So that's the work of the watchmen, that they should constantly keep on reminding God that you, you promised to reestablish Jerusalem. You promised to reestablish Jerusalem. They must not keep quiet. So it's similar to the proverb, the parable that Jesus told in Luke 11, 5 to 8 about the, the friend who went to knock at his friend's door at night, you know, and he knocked and knocked and knocked that he's received a visitor, he needs something, food or something to give his guest. And uh, Jesus was saying that um, even if the friend inside doesn't want to get up because he's tired, he's late, he's in bed, because of the shameless knocking of his friend, he will get up just so he can have some peace. That Okay, take the bread and go so I can sleep. So because of the shameless knocking, he will get up. So here, the watchmen are, are called to keep on reminding God that he promised to reestablish Jerusalem. He promised to reestablish Jerusalem until God does it. They mustn't keep quiet. So this also is a lesson for us Christians. If there's something you're waiting on the Lord for, you know, don't give up. Just keep on and on praying. Keep on praying. There might be a reason why he's not answered or it seems like he's not answered at that time. You know, maybe he's got something else in store for you, you know, but just keep on praying. Don't give up. Keep on and keep on and keep on saying, God, you know, how long am I going to wait? God, answer my prayers. Just keep on. And he will answer you in his own way. So, and then they now recount God's goodness, how, where, how he brought them up from Egypt, how God opened the Red Sea, how he gave them the promised land, how he's strong and mighty how he drove out all the enemies, how he uh, conquered all the enemy nations. They recounted everything that God has done. Uh, and in 65, God is saying that he is ready to respond to Israel, but they are the ones who are not yet ready to reach out to him. So you turn to God and he will turn to you. And then um, the final chapter is saying that Jerusalem is going to be purified and they're going to be glad. And here Jerusalem is imaged as a mother who is about to give birth and looking after her babies and comforting those who are grieving and mourning and God will give good gifts to his people and their happiness will be a witness to all other nations that's their happiness and this beloved is the end of the book of Isaiah and also the end of the summaries of the Old Testament so I thank you all so much to that you've been with me uh, I've, it's been nine months that i've done this uh, started uh, the old testament summaries in june 2018 it's now march 2019 and i've finished today so i thank you all so much i said i will tell you my own thoughts about whether uh, the isaiah was written by three or two isaiahs but no one's commented so i don't think you want to know if people are interested if you comment i'll make a short maybe five minute video about what I think if Isaiah was written by one, two or three Isaiahs. God bless you. Thank you. Bye. I am so happy.